Uh, many thanks, Sally, and can I just reiterate a, a warm welcome to everybody uh, to this particular session, People Plus Place Equals Connected Communities. Uh, this is the second session of, of the day, and I know a few of you will have joined us uh, this morning as well, where you will have heard a, a really interesting conversation and presentations thinking about the importance of home, the issues around right sizing, and in fact, what was coming out very clearly also about thinking about the right type of accommodation for people in, in later life, as well as the right place. Uh, and many of the presenters talked about the importance of community. So we're really privileged to have a, a stellar cast with us uh, this afternoon uh, to think a little bit more about that from both uh, from a community-led collaborative form of housing, building on some of the work that Housing Lynn has done through its directory of Collaborage, um, and can't say how thrilled that uh, we're joined by Bruce Moore, who's going to chair this session. And can I thank you personally, Bruce, uh, for your, both your involvement, but also uh, your sponsorship of, of this session. For those of you who don't know, uh, we've had over 3,000 people register for all our sessions, uh, about 800 individuals. So this has been a bumper a record for us. Um, so I'm delighted building on our happy hour platform that we're able to continue to deliver both a virtual summit and perhaps we may even go back to in-person events uh, in due course. But before I hand over to Bruce, I just want to, to thank all our sponsors who've made this summit possible. Uh, our four headline sponsors, Guinness, Tunstall, UKRI, Healthy Aging Ch Challenge and Love All Data Living, and our associate sponsors, including Housing 21, plus Extra Care, Chapter Plus, Faithful and Gould, Invisible Creations, Johnny Johnson Housing, ProCare, PRP, and Shakespeare Martineau. Big thanks to all uh, eight of you uh, as being our associate sponsors. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Bruce, Chief Executive of Housing 21, um, who is going to lead this session for us. Bruce, all yours. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, I think everyone knows we can achieve more when an area or a locality and its citizens combine their resources and come together with their time, their skills, their energy and their creativity um, to build a, a great collaborative community. And that's why it's really good to be um, chairing this session today. People and place really do make um, connected communities. And this is, as Jeremy said, the sec second session of day one of the Housing Lynn Summit 2023, which I think, Jeremy, is getting bigger and better. And I think, you know, with a host of wonderful speakers um, and literally hundreds of um, interested, informed participants. And I think we've got over 100 people live today already for this session. But I think we've got a lot more who can um, listen and, and watch this session, which is being recorded on online later. Um, as um, Sally said in her introduction as well, please do post any questions, not in the chat box, but in the Q&A session, so we can come and pick those up later at, at the end of the session. Hopefully it will be at least um, 20 minutes um, uh, for, for questions at the end. Uh, as Jeremy said, I'm, I'm Bruce Moore, I'm the Chief Executive Housing 21, and um, Housing 21 is a specialist provider of care and support, um, housing with care and support for older people of modest means and with an emphasis on quality, but helping people live better lives um, with dignity and autonomy, but that also a real sense of connection and community is really important. We work as an organisation across, right across England, more than 240 local authorities, and actually over 600 locations with schemes or courts in those each of those locations. And each of those is different and distinct. We have a devolved model, which has for local action, local engagement, um, local representation, local empowerment. But actually, it's really important that those are locally connected with each of their local communities. And that's really important. As an organisation, we don't get everything light, right, but we're learning and improving. We've invested so much in our infrastructure of our buildings. But actually, if by just investing in the buildings alone, that's not enough. We have to also make sure that the residents, the people in each of those properties and the communities the schemes are part of um, thrives and come together because housing really is a people business and, and being around for something, you know, and that's really crucial. Um, I've been around this sector for quite some time. I'm you know, too old now, really. But actually, one of the common frustrations that's been resonant since I started in, in housing and the housing sector um, was really recognising, not or not recognising enough, the transformative effect that housing can have. And it's so important to be well housed, to have quality of life and well-being. And I think we spend, and we do spend a lot of money on the health service, 
and on social care. And it used to be called the third leg of the stool, that housing was so important to be needs to be recognised. I personally don't like that three legged stool analogy um, because I prefer the sink analogy, um, the hot tap for health, the cold tap for care. But they both go down the plug hole unless you have got the right housing and, you know, people with house. But actually, the sink analogy goes a little bit further because the sink itself isn't the solution. Housing is not the solution. The housing is the crucible in which the human interactions take place where people have a say, they create their identities and relationships are forged. So I think housing is the catalyst, the inter intermediary, if you like, between people and place that creates the community and creates that potential. So anyway, enough from me. Um, I'm just as keen as I think everyone is to hear from our, our four sets of speakers today. Um, and first of all, those is, um, is, a, is a real uh, thought, thought leader um, in, the, in this field. Um, founder of the um, Nurture Development, uh, an author, most recent book, um, The Connected Communities Discovering the Health, Wealth and, um, and the Power of Neighbourhoods, and a real champion of ABCD, asset-based community development. So we're really fortunate to have Cormac Russell join us today. I know Cormac's not feeling 100% today, so really appreciate him, him, him coming and such to join the session. Um, next, we've got Lucy Hales who works for the best organisation ever, sorry, um, Lucy, for Housing 21. She's head of our co-housing and um, a great networker and really well connected in the West Midlands. Um, and she's on the director of street and operation experience of the co-housing solutions. And she's going to tell you a lot more about that. So I'm not going to steal any of Lucy's other thunder. And then we've got um, two representatives from um, University of Bristol um, School of Policy Studies. But um, Karen, Professor Karen West is going to join us for the questions, but she's going to leave the heavy lifting to Dr. Jim Hudson, who's going to do the presenting um, there. And he's the lead for collaborative housing and care, the CHIC project within University of Bristol. And fi finally, last but not least, we've got Dr. Yale Arbel um, from the Centre of Regional and Economic Social Research at Sheffield Hallam University, who specialises in research and co-housing and inequalities. And I think we really are blessed with a, a great panel of um, uh, thought leaders, practitioners and academics who have come together and hopefully build, build a great session. So without further ado from me, I'm going to pass over to, to Cormac. Thank you, Cormac. Thanks so much, Bruce. That's great. And great to be among such a, a thoughtful circle of wisdom holders. Um, so I, in over about maybe 10 or so minutes, 10, 12 minutes, what I wanted to do is just briefly touch on why I think neighbourhoods are such an important unit of change with respect to how we can build a, a real deep sense of belonging and connection uh, at the local level. The book, of course, is written in American English, so we spell neighbourhood incorrectly. We leave the U out, and it's important not to do that, actually. Um, so it's good to be on this side of the Atlantic and speaking uh, speaking with people who are serious about putting the U back into neighbourhood. So we do that, I think, by starting with what's strong, not wrong, in the sense of not ignoring problems, but really recognising that even in problems, there's a huge amount of possibility. And uh, I think... One of the challenges really is, is how can we understand that it's the people who live and sleep in a neighborhood in whatever shape or form their tenure takes shape, who are the primary architects of what living in that neighborhood looks like and feels like, that that's not something we can deliver as a program or a package to people. We can certainly catalyze, we can facilitate good community development, can enable but it's not something we could put our capes on and parachute in and do to or for people. So, so in that sense, I think one of the things that's been ennobling and energizing for me, particularly in the housing sector, is to see less of a, a focus on the half empty part of the glass and much more of a willingness to recognize that there's a lot of capacity, resource and competency in the individual and associational life of the people that we serve, that they're not passive consumers that need to be rescued or fixed, but that they're citizens. And that in that sense, uh, much of what they have to offer is centrally important to whatever solution uh, or whatever the future may hold. And moving towards a preferred future is really about recognizing that many of the things we need to build a preferred future 
in a citizen-led way are often invisible and maybe not so valued. So how do we make the invisible visible? I think one of the things to do is to acknowledge, not just in the areas of housing, but in other areas too, that we have become very, very institutionally oriented in how we invest money and how we think about problem solving. An example here is health, where we know that 80 to 85 percent of what determines health has a lot to do with associational life, with our personal agency, with social circumstances, with environmental and economic conditions. And yet so much, 80, 80, 85, 88 percent of the money is going into pharmacology, into the harder edge of medicine and medical intervention. So in a sense, you could say in the vernacular, we've got a contest between more hospital beds and more hospitable communities. And definitely there's a mismatch in terms of the amount of money that's going into hospitable communities. So I think, you know, with respect to housing, with respect to tenant engagement, with respect to maybe even a deeper, more progressive narrative about food sovereignty and just building communities where everybody in the neighborhood feels a sense that they're creators of well-being and creators of better outcomes. We need to think much more about how we invest in community development. And thinking about that, I think, is uh, a challenge because so much of the money is caught up with acute ends uh, in terms of interventions. And we really need to challenge that. And hopefully conferences like this throw out some of those more disruptive challenges and some of those tougher conversations. I say this not because I'm ideologically of the view that uh, it's a good idea in a democracy for citizens to be at the center, but because the evidence is very clear. And this is right across the piece. So when we look at evidence around what actually enables people to find sustainable livelihoods, people are four times more likely to find sustainable livelihoods in connected communities. Robert Sampson, probably the most preeminent social scientist with respect to uh, safer neighborhoods, is very, very clear in telling us that stronger neighborhoods have significantly less crime. And the reason primarily is because there's two key determinants to safer neighborhoods, and they're not necessarily anything related to more policing or more CCTV cameras. The two determinants of a safe neighborhood is how many neighbors you know by first name and how often you associate in the built and natural environment and do things together that are actually creating a better life. Those two things are more a determinant of safety than police response time. Doesn't mean that police response time isn't important, of course it is, but it's supplementary. It can deal with crime, but it cannot produce safety. And this is interesting because again, the preeminent uh, thought uh, with respect to well-being is often given over to health. But again, you look at the evidence, look at places like Froome, where they really became very intentional, particularly for people uh, in the third stage of life, to ensure that they were connected with at least six neighbors and doing things that they enjoyed doing. And it's interesting to say that over a three year period in terms of just measuring one indices, which is emergency hospital admissions, that while the rest of the county was seeing an increase of nearly 30 percent, they were able to affect a decrease of 17. Now, people will argue about causal and, you know, uh, so forth. But what's interesting here, I think, is over and over again, we work in 37 countries around the world at Nurture Development. We're seeing similar trends. So this kind of reflexive trends and moving into a serious investment in community building at the neighborhood level, at the small bounded place based level is absolutely critical at a range of levels, not just in terms of housing, but as Bruce said rightly, in terms of a whole host of different areas, social care, uh, health chief among them. And we're seeing in the UK context a lot of evidence that suggests, certainly to me and others, that this way of working can actually be proliferated. I'm cautious about using terms like scale, but I think proliferation is a more accurate use because proliferation suggests we can respect the very local and very diverse ways that uh, these principles can operate, while at the same time proliferating across cities like, for example, Leeds where they have 37 neighborhood networks in the city of Leeds and already now have 17 neighborhood asset-based community development initiatives where they're employing ABCD community practitioners to work at neighborhood level and to support people to be more connected and to be more active in their own neighborhoods on their own terms. This 
I suppose the economics of this is worth making some mention of, you know, costs in Leeds about £37,000 a year to, uh, if you're a municipality, to support somebody who needs the support economically to go into a congregated care setting. 30, 47,000, I think, last, last time I looked. It costs half of that to employ an asset-based community builder to work at neighborhood level. And on average, they support, on average, it's a lot more, I think, but on average, they support about 10 people who would have otherwise been in congregated care settings to find community alternatives and age well and with dignity in their home place as participating members of their neighborhood. So that's what I mean when I say Let's think about the neighborhood as the primary unit of change. We're doing this across the UK and in fact, across the world. And you continually get surprised. There's, there's, there is no full stop at the end of this process. We're continually learning at the feet of citizens. But I wanted to share briefly as I come to a close, a couple of the key learnings, and I'll try to whistle through this really quickly. But the first is that we have to pay attention to power that we have really recognized that as institutional roles elevate, we've seen uh, a retreat in terms of associational life and citizenship. And it's almost like a hydraulic relationship. We saw it to an extent in COVID as well, as our institutions started hitting the limits of their capacity and we started relocating functions back into community, for example, teaching our children at the kitchen table, we started to recognize that actually associational life really matters in all kinds of ways. And if I had one key message uh, for this conference, it would be let's put more emphasis on associational life and let's make sure that our institutional colleagues are really doing what they can to elevate the importance of citizenship and associational life and not appropriating functions in that hydraulic relationship that simply don't belong to them. Over and over again, we see that it's a misuse of our power to solve problems that don't belong to us. And one of the challenges, I think, with some housing providers is they've appropriated functions that actually would be much, much better in community space if we relocate the authority and relocate some of the resource. So that's maybe a challenge. Two things on a positive and affirmative note that I want to finish with is that we've seen now across thousands and thousands of communities that there are six key building blocks to healthy, and I would say prosperous and powerful communities. I don't have time to read them to you. I know you can do that yourself. But the point I want to make here is that these are virtuously interconnected, that there's an interdependence between all of these. We're talking about food sovereignty. We should really also be talking about soil. We should be talking about culture. We should be talking about place economic exchange. If we're thinking about, you know, how a neighborhood of say six, 7,000 people can cope well with the current economic challenges. But we also need to be talking about what would happen if there were shared, a shared fleet of uh, electric vehicles in that neighborhood which was removing the burden of every family home needing a car, for example. So thinking about this in, in terms of the connection between these, uh, these various building blocks is key, but also thinking about the relationship between institutions and non-institutional folks in ordinary community life. And I think there's a virtuous relationship. You know, there are two tools for social change and indeed for great communities. One is institutions, we need them, they're amazingly important, but the other is the circle. It's the community where people are more oriented to the informality of choice, care, citizenship, and capacity. And I think when we get those two right, we don't end up with silly solutions. You know, I often say silos are where smart people go to do dumb things, and this is certainly a dumb thing. People don't need us to walk their dogs, but they do need us to do other things. And I'll perhaps finish on this. It seems to me that we can take everything that I've said and kind of use a closing metaphor that what we're trying to do when we create social change is rather like a three lane swimming pool where there are things that communities can do themselves in the first lane if we remove the barriers, cheer them on and resource them. And it's not all about money. Sometimes it's just about respect. In the second lane, there are things communities can do, but they need a bit of help. Let's be on tap rather than on top when we give them that help. That's the whole idea of public service, that we're there to serve, not to dictate. And then finally, in the third lane, there are things that communities do need institutions to do for them. Well, let's do those things and let's do them, you know, with the sense of privilege that we have for being paid to do them. But I'd finish by simply saying we cannot know what communities need from institutions 
until we first know what communities have themselves. So let's start with what's strong, not with what's wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cormac. Really great, thoughtful insights there to, to really get us going. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to pass over to Lucy, who's going to now talk about the co-housing project. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me today. Can everybody hear OK? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share with you Housing 21's um, ambitious plans for co-housing. It's the housing that we're planning to build for older people in inner city communities. And it really is a project where people plus place equal connected communities. Um, Bruce has given you a little bit of background already to Housing 21, but in case anybody missed it, um, we're um, a not-for-profit housing association and we provide both retirement, living and extra care properties for older people of modest means. We operate in, um, as Bruce has said, just over 240 local authority areas and we manage around 22,000 um, properties for older people. We've developed a co-housing strategy as an additional housing option to our other two business strands. And, it's a fo and our co-housing strategy has a focus on um, communities that offer mutual support where neighbours look out for each other. It recognises that residents may come from diverse backgrounds, but they have a commitment to living in a community with a culture of respect. Our plan is that our co-housing projects will focus on the areas in the lowest five um, categories from the English indices of deprivation and or where 30% of the, the um, population is identified from a minority ethnic group. We believe that this approach will help inform our designs and operating models for the future in order to meet the changing needs and requirements of older people, but specifically those from minority ethnic backgrounds. So what will our co-housing projects look like? We think, ideally, co-housing projects should have between 16 and 25 properties. We believe that will enable a sense of community and an opportunity to really get to know your neighbours and deliver a sense of belonging. And, but it also means that it will be financially viable in terms of revenue funding. Our preference is for rented tenure as that's something that financial institutions prefer um, and they're the people that provide us with the loans to build our schemes because they see that as a much lower risk. However, the strategy does give us an opportunity um, to um, consider shared ownership. And for those of you who may not know, that's a project that gives an older person the opportunity to buy a share in a property. So where someone would be selling um, a home, a property, they would have access to appropriate housing that they otherwise would be unable to afford. Um, in the, and it would give them the opportunity to remain in their community. To ensure that our co-housing designs meet the lifestyle requirements of residents, we're working with older people and communities where we're proposing to build co-housing to understand their needs and aspirations. So this means taking a flexible approach scheme by scheme. Whilst Housing 21 has a lot of experience providing housing for older people, we know that it would be a real mistake to parachute into an area where we've not developed in before and with computer communities that we have limited experience of working with and expect to be welcomed unconditionally. Local people are less likely to trust us unless we make a real effort to develop links and build relationships with community groups and agencies rooted in a particular area. Our first co-housing schemes will be built in Birmingham. So from very early on in the project, we've been partnering with an, um, an agency with called Legacy West Midlands. They're a Birmingham based charity and community group, and they have enabled us to engage with older people in the communities that we would like to work in. Legacy have been working with Housing 21 over the last three years, 
As I said, they're a community-based organisation and they've got four key priorities, which are arts, heritage, wellbeing and community cohesion. And Dawn Carr from um, Legacy WM has joined the session this afternoon um, and it, uh, maybe will contribute to some of the answers to the questions at the end. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Together, we've already involved communities in the design phase and we've learned building a community of like-minded people is welcomed. Potential residents have reinforced our view of the be benefits of co-housing including the opportunities for shared activities and also reducing social isolation and loneliness. Our consultation sessions have told us that there's lots of um, interesting opportunities to use the common house for exercise classes and other fitness activities. Maintaining the communal garden and cooking a communal meal together, along with safety and security of a door entry system, have all been viewed incredibly positively. In respect of the design of individual flats, a separate kitchen will, um, is preferred so that cooking smells are contained and a guest room for relatives to stop um, in is seen as a really good idea. Our consultations um, in communities across the Birmingham have interested both interest and enthusiasm, as well as housing need. The first co-housing project has planning permission and it will be built in the Lizelles area of Birmingham, starting later this year. Lizelles is one of the most deprived wards in Birmingham. The scheme will have 25 apartments. Some of them will be one bed and some two bed. There will be a common house and communal grounds. Working with local people from Rizal's at a very early stage has um, created, a, is starting to create a co-housing community. And we've got a group of local people who are interested in both living in the new properties as well as being part of the new co-housing community. The local people we initially engaged with have been women from the Bangladeshi community. And more recently, people from an African Caribbean background have joined the group. With Legacy WM and the interested potential residents, we're now designing a skills building programme. And that we see as being a tool to increase capacity, create a team and grow confidence. This we hope will ensure the expertise and commitment needed for, success, for a successful co-housing community. However, our journey has been far more than working with communities and agencies such as Legacy. We also need the buy-in of politicians and we have the politicians on board in Birmingham and the links that we forged have helped us to get their buy-in um, for the schemes that we want to build and Birmingham have identified sites that they own for us to purchase and they supported us with um, planning applications. Can I have the next slide please? In respect of defining what um, age someone would be to qualify for our co-housing offer. We've reflected again on how people plus place equal connected communities. At Housing 21, our retirement living schemes give priority to applicants who are over 65. However, in the areas where we aspire to deliver our co-housing option, we think that the 65 years age limit criteria may not be appropriate due to health disadvantages faced by the people who live in these communities. And these inequalities were brought into sharp focus during the COVID-19 pandemic. With a report from the UK Health Foundation recognising that people in these communities, in the most disadvantaged communities, were 2.2 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than those from the least disadvantaged areas. So to accommodate the outcomes we were aiming to achieve, it may be appropriate to adopt a more flexible approach um, to the age limit. Um, but we will also take into account health and wellbeing data and we'll work with each of the project groups to agree the most appropriate age for eligibility. But it will need to be in line with our social purpose, which are, where applicants must be at least 55. And finally, a little bit about our operating models. One thing we do know is that one size isn't going to fit all. 
and we need um, and we aim to give each project group the opportunity to make the decisions around the operating model for their scheme. We've identified four options in our strategy, but we've not ruled out that there may be other ways of working and it may be a bit of mix and match through it through the models that we've identified. We've identified that residents might wish to create a tenant management organisation and that option would mean that residents entered into a legal management agreement as well as being part, paid an annual management and maintenance allowance so that they could carry out the management duties allocated to them in relation to their housing. Appointing a managing agent would be our sec second option and that enables the co-housing community to potentially appoint an agency rooted in the community who has the appropriate skills to manage the project. Resident-led services have been identified as the third option and that can be used where residents want to control and make decisions on some management areas but maybe leave the rest of housing 21 as the landlord. And, and this would have a menu of options for residents to choose from. And our fourth model is a Housing 21 light service. And that would be where residents opt for the more traditional retirement living service where a court manager is appointed to deliver, the serv to deliver services in a similar way to how our retirement living model operates. One thing that we do know is that things are likely to change and the operating model chosen at the start may not be appropriate in years to come. So what we really need is flexibility to be built in. So if I could have the, the last slide, please. Thank you. So thank you for listening. And I hope that um, our co-housing project has shown how people plus place equal connected communities. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. That's great. Um, and hopefully um, there's some questions about sort of sharing information, which hopefully we'll address um, when yeah. we get to the Q&A session. But um, hopefully some, some more there. And, and I think we've got um, uh, Yale next, um, Dr. Yale Albal, who's going to talk about um, her work at Sheffield Hallam. Thank you, Yale. Hi, thank you. So thanks again for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Such an interesting session already. Um, so when I had my 10 minutes to talk about this, I thought what makes communities really connected is people participating. So I thought I'll talk about the bright side and the dark side of participation. Can I have the next slide, please? So I'll start off by introducing what community-led housing and co-housing is in, turn, in case someone doesn't know, and then quickly talk about how participation can offer some social connection, but also some challenges for inclusion and diversity. And I'll finish off with some positive um, recommendations. So I'll start off with what community-led housing is. Next slide, please. Uh, can we have please the next slide? Thank you. So community-led housing is really like an umbrella term for housing that is managed and developed by members of the community to meet their housing needs and it's done not for profit and there's a range of, of models for that some have been with us for decades some are fairly new and they have different you know management and ownership models next slide and community-led housing is known to have many benefits because people are taking part and participating having a voice it enables them to really have the housing that they need they feel it's a safe space because it's not for profit, it's often more affordable, it offers them secure tenure. And, you know, uh, studies show that people have higher um, satisfaction rates in cooperatives, for example. And Karen and Jim are probably going to talk to you how it tackles loneliness and creates more social connection. And the, the, the thing we need to think of in relation to participation is that some people need these things more urgently than others. And some people can access these benefits more easily than others, but it's not necessarily the same groups. And this is what I'm gonna be talking about in, in this presentation. So the next slide, um, just introducing what co-housing is. Co-housing is the smallest sector in the community-led housing world in, in this country. It's an intentional community. People join it with the intention to live as part of the community with a shared goal. And it's, it's got a physical and social structure that increase 
increases social connection. People have private homes, but also shared facilities, a shared garden, a common house where people can eat together, cook together, do the laundry, collect their mail, lots of opportunities to meet other people. And because people manage and often develop the building and planning as well, so they have a lot of stake in it, a lot of say in it, and a lot of opportunities to work with fellow members. So one, one, people I, one person I spoke to about this said, in a really nice way that it's a way to it's an easy way to make friends because you know all your neighbors you see them in formal settings all the time so it's easy to then go and say oh can I have a bit of sugar uh, do you want to come over for a cuppa can you mind my kids it, it just creates this opportunity to know your neighbors really well and often you select your neighbors in these neighborhoods as well so this is another element of really feeling safe in these communities the thing is that it's in this country unlike what Housing 21 is now pioneering, it's predominantly privately owned and therefore predominantly middle class as well. So that, that's where this high level of participation and innovation means it's also quite exclusive. So next slide, I'm gonna talk about the nice things, the bright side of participation, because what we know about communities is that communities are created through people being in community. And it gives us you know, a strong sense of connection and belonging because if we created it, we have more stake in it. We feel it's really ours because we shaped it and we have a good sense of ownership on it, not necessarily financially, but in a more deep you know, social sense. And you know, when people plan their housing, they plan the housing that they need. We know there's shortage of affordable family homes, right? Because that the market doesn't you know, provide these. But when people develop the housing they need, they can develop the housing that they really need and it empowers them. And when participation is done right, it not only empowers people and connects them, it connects them in a deep way to develop tolerance and empathy. So they're really tuned in to what their neighbors need and they're willing to compromise on what they otherwise wouldn't because they really know their neighbors well. So in a normal situation, for I'll give you an example. In my community, I live in a co-housing community. We have a laundrette. One of our members have really high standards in terms of cleanliness. She was shocked when she saw our, <laughs> our washing machine that were donated to the common house. So she cleaned them really thoroughly and explained to us for how, what we need to do to look after our uh, washing machines. And now everyone's, if, including people who wouldn't really notice the dirt, or the mold, give them a good wipe after every use and really leave them open. And, you know, people change their behavior. You know, it's not the easiest thing to do for them, but they do it because they know it's important to, to other members of the community. And that's like a tiny example of how when you see the others, you change your behavior. But on the other hand, and I'm going to the next slide, please. Um, participation can on, also create social exclusion if it's done in a different way because when when people hear the word community it's often tends to it like this kind of beautiful glow of warm nice feeling of harmony but actually communities are often spaces of disagreement inequality conflict and it's very hard to work together with all these people who accidentally live next door to you most most communities aren't co-housing communities you know people just happen to live next to each other and even in co-housing communities, people are still different. They have different values, different interests. And, you know, working together is not always simple. And these inequalities within the community mean that sometimes, very often, in fact, you'll find the usual suspects participating and some people not having their voice heard. And these usual suspects are often people with more resources, more skills, more experience, more time, more confidence, more connections. They'll be able to say, oh, I know someone in the council. I'll speak to them. I'll ask my solicitor friend. I'll ask my accountant friend. You know, they're used to going to meetings. They're used to having their voice heard. Other people may feel really daunted by going to a formal meeting with someone taking minutes or having to facilitate a meeting can be actually a very mortifying experience if you've not done it before. 
So going to, to the next slide, communities need to think how they balance equality and liberty. Can you just press the button again? So there's something written under liberty. Yeah, thanks. So often there's a trade-off between these two. So people compromise, like Lucy was saying, people compromise some of their liberties in terms of participation and agency and you know, managing every single aspect of the project in, you know, and they trade it for greater accessibility and affordability and inclusion. So you trade off some of your autonomy, but what you gain is a community that you can actually be part of without being a middle-class professional who knows how to build a housing development or manage it. Next slide, please. When I spoke to a housing professional, she told me that often these kind of community-led housing models draw people who are already empowered in other areas in their lives. And this is why they think, oh, I can also be empowered in this area when this country is mostly top down, it just happens to you. But it's not really attractive to other people who think, how am I going to fit this into my life? I have quite, a, you know, a plate full of stuff to, to do. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And I've got two more, so don't, don't worry. Um, this, one element about participation that I wanted to focus on is that in my research on co-housing, I found that often it's the subtle barriers to, to, particip to participation that are also barriers to joining these communities. So co-houses in this country and in other countries as well often have specific life experiences that implicitly uh, are required for participation. Most co-houses in, in this country are highly educated, almost half of us our postgraduates. And we speak a certain language, not just English, but this particular sophisticated professional English that we use in meetings. And many have history of activism and volunteering. They feel comfortable going to meetings. They feel comfortable sitting in committees. They feel comfortable being in these spaces and taking initiative. People have high literacy skills and digital skills. They feel comfortable writing and reading minutes, following their emails, checking their phone apps, texting each other, you know, being on top of all these messages. This is not accessible to some other people with, you know, maybe who don't even have an iPhone or, or a smartphone. And this is something we saw with the residents of Housing 21. They need to think of other ways of managing these things. And um, the next slide. So if communities want to plan to participate in a more inclusive way, I have four, you know, three points. The first is that the homes themselves need to be affordable and accessible and enable people to age in place. So it's inclusive in, you know, over time. The second thing is that communities need to be welcoming and tolerant. So if someone comes along and speaks a different language or behaves in a different way, the communities need to have policies in place, not just good intentions, but actual policies to ensure that they welcome them in a respectful way. And the third thing is the management structures, because if decisions are made in a way that's really complicated and daunting and impossible, if you're not a professional, they're going to be exclusive. And this is how participation becomes a bar. You know, there's a barrier to participation. If the management structure is such that it welcomes people to join in a simple, clear way, this is how we see participation as a, a gateway rather than a fence. That's the last one. Thank you very much. That's great. I, lots of food for thought there, Yael. Yael, Yael. Um, I think, um, yes, I'm sure we're going to come back to some of those challenges you posed in terms of in, in the questions, because I think you know, the, that balance um, is, is and those tensions are, are really evident. So um, I'm going to pass over now for our last set, um, presentation from to Dr. Jim Hubson. Jim? Thanks, thanks. Um... Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk briefly uh, about the project that myself and Karen, who's uh, leading the research, are uh, working on currently. It's called Chic, um, uh, Collaborative Housing and Innovations in Care. Um, and I suppose it's important to start by saying we're right in the in the very heart of the research at the moment. It's a it's a three year project uh we're into the final year and we've done most of the field work but we're uh, 
uh, working currently on analysing the data and really deciding what it is that we've we've got to say about this. And I realise, uh, listening to the other uh, three speakers previously, who were all um, brilliant, not just in themselves, but uh, I was thinking how this uh, short presentation is uh, seems very focused, really, on uh, a kind of um, narrow range of quite in a way quite technocratic issues to do with health and aging and it's great um, particularly where Cormac started first in this story to um, to kind of have those building blocks that are the background to our uh, to our research so I can go straight into uh, uh, some of the nitty-gritty of this um, next slide please so uh, the project asks an apparently simple question, which is in what ways might collaborative housing meet the social care and support needs of older people? Uh, we did uh, six case studies, um, of which three were co-housing schemes, and the other three are other kinds of self-managed later life housing projects. I'm not going to talk about those other three because in such a short time, we, we have so much data from this project that we're still sorting through, and I thought I'd focus uh, for this presentation just on the three co-housing um, schemes to keep it at least uh, slightly similar. Um, as I've said, the, uh, the project is due to finish end of this year, um, and we've done so far over 100 interviews, multiple focus groups, uh, and quite a lot of just general hanging out with groups and, and seeing what life is like and how people help and support each other. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just to outline the three case studies, um, we've actually, Yale has already talked about the uh, definitions of co-housing, so I don't really need to talk about that so much, but uh, all three schemes uh, that we're looking at here, and we've, uh, they've ch we've changed the names, these are not the real names, um, uh, were co-designed and created by their residents and are fully controlled by those residents. Um, only one of the three, Hazel Lanes, that first one, is explicitly senior co-housing and actually the only one in the UK. Um, Meadow Ridge um, has uh, possibly a majority of older residents, but a, a mix of ages, and Sundial Yard um, is more uh, multi-generational, but with a significant number of older uh, members. Um, having said that, it's important to emphasise that we're not conflating care need with chronological age or with uh, disability. Those are, uh, are definitely, in any perspective, um, not, the, not the same things. Um, next slide, please. So some key early findings, and I do emphasize early. Um, I suppose to start, possibly the, the least surprising um, among the uh, co-housing schemes is a strong evidence of social organization through shared activity and uh, resource pooling. Slightly more surprising because we have one scheme that's, uh, that's been established for more than 20 years, um, is how sustainable those communities have been. And that, that one in particular, after, after 20 plus years, they're still coming together to eat, to cook and eat three times a week. There's still a strong uh, feeling and practice of community. Um, we've we've been very attentive to the to the preventative health uh, and and well being role of these groups. Although I think as uh, as Cormac touched on at the beginning, it's very difficult to measure, um, almost impossible in fact, because you'd you'd have to compare like with like. But um, uh, as Yale has also mentioned, uh, this piece of research builds on some research that we did a couple of years ago. Um, where we were able to, to pretty much conclusively show that people living in collaborative communities were, uh, were less lonely and their sense of well-being was greater, even when compared with people with a similar number of social connections and level of uh, social activity. Uh, we found a lot of evidence uh, of mutual support practices, especially over short term periods, such as uh, supporting individuals returning from hospital stays uh, in terms of cooking, shopping, etc. And most importantly, I guess in this context or in the context of our research question, was that 
individuals were able to return earlier from um, spells in hospital than they might be, or even at all in some cases. On one hand, having said that, members in all three groups that we looked at emphasized that this was not personal care that they gave each other or, or social care in the sense that we know it. Um, but interestingly, we found evidence in, in practice that groups went far further than they had agreed to in their, in their agreements that they'd signed up to or, or worked out as a group. Um, at the same time, obviously, there were found to be practical and social limits to, to that level of mutual support. Um, and perhaps the most surprising thing or the thing that we didn't um, uh, think that we'd find or expect was what we're calling an advocacy or brokerage role um, played by co's housing members around health conditions. I'm going to um, come back to this. Um, and while uh, usually adult children can continue to play an important role um, in the care of their parents, uh, we noticed that also there was a there was a, a it was a complex situation of reciprocation sometimes and, and sometimes support for those children who were supporting their parents from the rest of the group. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, as I mentioned, this gets quite technical at the moment. I'm sure um, when I present something about this in six months time, it would be much slicker. So bear with me here. I'm not going to go through uh, all of this because I'm aware the, uh, the writing is very small for a start. Um, but as I said, what seems to really stand out uh, as unexpected to us was the way in which each community um, supported at least one group member during a major transition. And by major transition, uh, what I mean is a move out of the group into a nursing home or, or sadly in uh, three cases, um, in all three groups, uh, the death of a member. Um, support and advocacy around these events has sometimes involved quite complex interactions involving the other members of the group, uh, the person's family members and formal medical support. Um, so we found it useful to carefully analyse and pick apart a number of these events in detail to really get down to what happens and who are the key actors. Um, the, the case that we're looking at here is Ed, Eric, not his real name, from Meadow Ridge Co-Housing. Eric was diagnosed with lung cancer during the first main COVID lockdown in March 2020. Uh, and this timeline runs for about a year until, uh, sadly, until his death uh, the following year. Um, Eric had previously lost his wife and his son lived abroad. And these factors combined with and at times... Um, well, frankly, very poorly coordinated and inadequate response from the NHS during COVID, which is understandable, I guess, in a number of ways, uh, meant that the community's members played a far bigger role than might otherwise have been the case. Uh, but nonetheless highlights the level of support that's possible. I think I've lost my screen there, Jerome. Is he there? I'll carry on anyway. I will pop your... Um... Oh, I've got I'll it here. Right. I'll Sorry, put it uh, back on the screen. Apologies, my uh, computer. My connection just dropped. I'm back now. All right. I'll, um, okay. I'm going to read a couple of bits very quickly anyway. All right. I'll just share the screen again. There you go. Cheers. Thanks. So, um, oh, just go back to the previous one, previous slide there, Jerome. Yep. Thanks. Um, so just to, to pick a couple of bits out of that, um, working down the timeline in order, members of the group provide Eric with meals on a rota basis. Eleanor and Lisa, the latter a trained physio, provide daily visits, help getting out of bed, physio and emotional support. Eric contacts his son who travels from abroad and moves in with Eric for the rest of his illness. Eleanor and Lisa continue to provide a key advocacy role dealing with Eric's GP and other relevant care services. There's been a significant delay in getting appropriate levels of care due to the lockdown. Um, and then towards the, the final stage where there's already formal care in place, but the group continues to supply uh, to support with rotor on a, on a rotor basis, food and visits, including supporting Eric's son. Uh, sadly, Eric died during the transfer to a hospice in March 2021, but importantly, was able to stay at home until his final day. Uh, next slide, please. And then we've, we've broken that down further or looked at it in, in a slightly different way, um, perhaps more usefully, visually. 
uh, the, the same situation and series of events with, uh, with Eric, but um, breaking this down into his supportive connections, if you like, as a network analysis. Um, the, the yellow in the core is the role of family and, and close support within the group. Uh, the blue is Eric's wider household, and the, in, in the home of the, the blue is the, uh, the rest of the community. And the green is uh, external support, uh, mainly uh, external health services. Uh, final slide, please. So um, I've called this conclusions and further questions. Actually, at this stage, it's mainly further questions, to be frank, but uh, I will uh, go through uh what we're uh currently thinking if you like um i suppose to pull back a bit the co-housing model really does we think offer many benefits as a place to age and as an intentional neighborhood uh mutual support um, which is much talked about in principle in in the co-housing model um extended further and into different areas than we expected um and then I guess we, we have some questions, which is not to overlook the, the values that we've we've already uh, found from the research. Um, one of the questions is, or, or commentaries really, is that we found a, a reluctance among more than one of the groups to to plan formally for for care needs as the as the group ages. Um, and we wondered, um, in comparison with some of the uh, other schemes that we've looked at, one's a housing co-op, and we've been um, extending slightly to look at ideas of cooperative care and care co-ops. Um, we wondered uh, whether schemes could benefit from a tailored external service that provided practical support and personal care, and even extended into this um, advocacy support area, which, um, to be fair to the groups, these, these advocacy roles of individuals supporting a particular person um, can become very stressful in themselves, and we wonder how sustainable those, those um, roles can be. Um, and finally, could succession planning be improved? And by succession, we, uh, uh, we're wondering about the, the situations where it's a, it's a paradox, really, victims of their own success, the, the neighbourhoods that are created as part of these schemes are of such quality that nobody has to move, nobody wants to move out unless they have to, um, which means a tendency to, to age as a cohort. Um, but again, to pull back from all this and conclude really, uh, as I say, while all of these findings and, and some of what we're looking at it tends to be the nitty gritty and rather instrumental around um, care. I think it's easy to overlook what's really been achieved by these communities more broadly, just in terms of creating good neighbourhoods. And uh, I think the, the term Cormac used was as, the associational life um, and a better, more companionable uh, quality of later life. Um, so thank you very much. That's me. Uh, that's brilliant. So thank you for all our presenters. Um, I, I think um, just looking at some of the questions in the in the Q and A session, um, there seem to be um, a couple of themes are uh, emerging, which just picks up on that last point that um, Jim was talking about, which is about the age issue. Um, Lucy mentioned it in terms of the um, the communities, in terms of what is an older community. And um, I think Maggie Gilbert's been making some comments in the in in the the questions as well about age and you know ghettos and um, sort of the the age balance. So I, I, I'm going to open it up and see who wants to sort of tackle the issue about sort of the ageism. I think um, uh, Rose Gilroy has actually made the comment: uh, Is there any learning that we can take from other more established co-housing communities in, in other um, other countries? Um, to about the aging um, issue that Jim Jim just referred to there, but so I want to you know see who wants to to jump in and sort of tackle the age things. Go on, Karen. You you've been answering some of the the comments in the chat. Do you want to come in on this? So oh, on the on the age question, yeah. So I responded to Maggie's question that you know I do agree that you know she's saying that we should avoid ghettos of, of older people, and I think you know intergenerational. Uh, connections are, are part of the answer, aren't they? But I think, I mean, 
as Jim said, only one of our co-housing communities actually is intentionally for and by uh, older people, uh, the cutoff age there being 50, I think it's 50 plus that particular community. But what you find is that where people have an intention to establish a co-housing community, they quite often end up being places where predominantly older people live um, because those are the other people that have the sort of the housing capital uh, to make that investment. So they're not intentionally uh, older, but they end up often being uh, older communities. Um, what else did I want to say? I mean, I think going back to something that Yale said really kind of resonated with me. And that's not to detract, as Jim has said, from, you know, the, the wonderful support that these communities do uh, give you know, to their residents, to their members. But, you know, communities can be uh, exclusionary. There can be conflict. And they are places where, you know, where it takes work, you know, to make these communities gel together, to make them uh, sustainable. And that is an issue, you know, for older people. And, and I think this sort of connects, I think, with some of the things that Lucy was saying about their kind of very pragmatic response from Housing 21, which is to look at a range of, you know, operating models and to be kind of be prepared to be flexible about, you know, where Housing 21 backs off and lets residents do things for themselves, but then, you know, is kind of behind the, the scenes and recognises that there may come a point, you know, with this, issue of cohort aging that housing 21 may need to be kind of prepared to kind of step in again and take up a role that's more perhaps akin to some of their other kind of extra care communities or sheltered housing uh, facilities um i'm sure there are lots of other things i could say the, the other thing i was going to say about about aging as well is that i think and jim's alluded to this is that well what we found in co-housing communities is that people respond really well, you know, to a crisis, to these kind of transitional uh, events. What doesn't seem to be happening quite so much uh, is planning for later life. So whereas, you know, we talk about co-housing communities as being very intentional communities, and they are intentional in lots of different ways around, you know, sharing meals, car sharing, you know, being sort of ecologically sustainable and so on. Later life doesn't necessarily seem to feature in that planning and that intentionality. Um, and different people have different ideas about what later life might mean, how they want to deal with it, how they want to tackle it. Even things like, you know, how um, the spare, the, the guest flat might be used, whether that's going to be used for care in the future or whether it isn't. And that seems to kind of bring out differences between people in how they view that and how they think about later life and how they plan uh, for later life. I'll stop there. Sorry, I've said too much already. Yeah, you, you definitely haven't said yeah. too much. Uh, thank mm. you, Karen. Um, Yale, do you want to come back on that? I don't really know what to say. I thought that was really quite comprehensive. <laughs> so I suppose really if I could just come in then, I'd perhaps provoke a bit, a bit more more thoughts in terms of um, age is just one characteristic, and I think yeah, you know, we you know, and we we have we fall into the trap perhaps of ageism when we assume that just because of age that everything else is you know that everyone's the same at, at, in aging so i think even within it you know within a with an aged community you can have quite a lot of diversity and i think we have to think about how diversity comes out in in, in other ways but i suppose um the points that are being made all and by karen and jim and others about the aging process and how it, you know co-housing is is you know becoming a, a, an option for older people is perhaps become some of the barriers that other people have identified i think um tim in the questions um uh, raised the issues in terms of the challenges i think you know you referred to them about sort of the um the more able the more middle class the more educated the more you know people who can access resources in a more powerful way are those who are forming these communities and what can we do to unlock those or overcome some of those barriers that people are always face in terms of you know finding the right sites coming over the financial measures coming over the bureaucracy that comes with the these challenges so Perhaps I can yeah, I'll go back to you again on this to see if you because you, you your your slides were so insightful um, about whether you can give us any thoughts on that. Well, I think one of the questions we need to ask ourselves seriously is who is actually interested in being so empowered and who wants to lead a community development? Because I think the answer is not everyone, and probably the majority of people don't want to. 
and you know it relates to to the quote from from the housing advisor I spoke to that I think lots of people are just really genuinely not interested in it and obviously there's a there's a price that you know they miss out on all the lovely connectedness and empowerment that we that we are talking about but I don't know I think the answer is there aren't easy answers because there's a whole structure that makes it so difficult to develop housing, you know, political structure, cultural structure. And, you know, for example, if you live in this kind of thing, how are you going to inherit to your children? How are you going to cope when, when you're older? Are you really interested in constantly being in touch with all these other people? It's, it's a complex, it's a complex issue. I, I suppose you, you you make the point there, and I think the comments just been made in the in the question session that uh, uh, questions there that actually isn't for everybody. Um, not everybody wants to be empowered, um, but actually I, I was I was struck by Cormac's um, uh, comments about about the sort of the pressures of the institution almost obliterate the scope for people to have the choice. And and is there anything you know? Lucy and co-housing and work with Legacy West Midlands, we're trying to be sort of a broker that agency and create that capacity to engage because it's not naturally there. But as, what can we do to sort of, um, in effect, take the, the institutional dominance, taking a step back and allowing communities to take their, take their space? Lucy, do you want to share any of the insights you've gathered from, from the work you've been trying to do? Yeah, sure. I, I think just giving people that opportunity, I think people are really actually quite surprised that somebody wants to come along and and, and engage and, and talk to them about this. So there's, there's a bit of like, why and what are you doing here? And so that that has been quite, quite fascinating to sort of all is so you've got to get people's confidence to enable them to engage and, and give them a reason to engage, um, even if it's not specifically individually for them. And that's one of the things that we've used the consultation sessions for is very much to spread the word amongst the community, because some people come along and they're too young, maybe, but we can still have that that conversation, we can still talk to them about the aspirations for the co-housing scheme, really just to get the wider message out across the community. Um, because the art is to reach in to these communities. So our consultation, our initial consultation events really just scratch the surface effectively. Like you've been out and, and seen some of the, the events. Yeah, you're um it's it's really the can opener, isn't it? That that first that first session. How, how do you sort of feel? You know, what's your interpretation when we're we're in uh, in bits of the dual recorder or in Lasalle's engaging with people? Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I think there's something really unique about what you do because normally it's people who've already read quite a lot about co-housing decided deciding to develop this, and this you kind of turn it upside down and introduce a completely novel concept to people who never heard of it. And now they need to engage quite enthusiastically with it. And I think that's a big jump mm. and probably takes a while. So when you first present it, I think people need to just get their heads around it. And it takes a lot of time from grasping it to being in a position to actually be actively involved and leading, you know, take the lead. And this will probably take a long time. Yeah, definitely. And I think the slowness of the planning process and the development process is, is I think people are a bit bit wary at, at times of, of that as well. And one of the questions that's been asked is, is um, can the learning from this and how, how can the learning from this um, um, be applied more universally? Because this yeah, I think Yale, you made the comment, and I think we all know, know that co-housing is quite a small, precious thing, and um, you know it, it has a wider perspective. Uh, sorry, I didn't realise your hand was up, Karen. I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment, or perhaps you can try have a go at answering that. 
Um, well, I don't, don't know if I'm directly asking that, but I, that, there was, I mean, two things. I think Rose Gilroy in the chat asked about uh, learning from other countries where co-housing is a more established model, which indeed it is in Scandinavian countries, in the Netherlands and France and Germany, perhaps to a lesser extent. But for me also, there's this thing, and it connects to this actually, is that there's this kind of lingering question that I think that Cormac initially posed about the balance and which Lucy was referring to as well, about the, the, the balance between institutions and community. And sort of, you know, institutions are being given a bad name and communities are being given this kind of wonderfully good name. But, but actually, I think there's some, there's a kind of sweet spot in the middle there, isn't there? And I think the difference between co-housing in this country and some of those other countries in which it's more established is that we're expecting co-housing, and this is part of the Housing 21 experiment, to do an awful lot of heavy lifting. Uh, because institutions are more or less absent in this terrain. Now, Jim, Jim and I, in our project, we're focusing on social care, but the social care system is, is, is practically collapsed, isn't it? So, you know, you're putting an awful lot of weight on these communities to actually provide these services that the state has kind of backed away from, which isn't the case so much in other countries. So, so there isn't all that kind of worry, you know, and anxiety that's wrapped around co-housing communities. They can fulfil their function in creating engaging and lively spaces uh, in which to live without all that worry about whether, you know, how they're actually going to deliver care. I don't know if that answers the previous question, but that was, yeah, a thought. Jim? You're on mute, Jim. Classic. Um, just to, to add to Karen's point, really, and, and I think one of the previous questions about what what models can we learn from something that we we didn't cover because i'd focused on the co-housing but of the other three groups one of them was a housing co-op and i think it's we we kind of forget the heritage of housing cooperatives here in the uk which which was much more of a mass movement than than co-housing perhaps potentially could be um and it, it we see it as a kind of as, as far as we saw through this project as perhaps kind of a looser fit framework that, that doesn't need the the intentionality that the co-housing model requires and and perhaps would appeal to more people where where you there's that framework already established of, of how housing cooperatives work and not everybody has to be a part of that on a daily basis you don't have to eat together regularly or or sign up to very much at all you just have to be a member of that co-op and it and you can self-manage things that way so it's it's not what co-housing is and it doesn't claim to be but it's a model there that i think should be looked at uh, in greater detail I, I'm going to come to Jeremy in just two seconds, but I think Yale in one of her slides put it, it's like, I, I think it was yeah, Yale about the democracy, it's like a mini democracy, or was that, or was that you, Jim? But what somebody, I, think, I remember it seeing in the, yeah, in the slides saying, it's like a mini democracy and um, it needs to be cherished like that. And I think it is, um, that is part of the issues in terms of how many rules we create or how many structures we put around things will depend the sort of the spectrum like with many other things things are on a spectrum it's not either one or the other there's a spectrum of sort of type of, of provision so co-housing is probably quite an intense community Co -co housing cooperative is, is is a little bit more dynamic in different ways but there are same sort of principles applying um come to jeremy i'm going to got a question to, to put, put to cormac but jeremy do you want to come in first yeah, thanks, Bruce. And in fact, I was going to pick up on the, the, the democratic, democratic issue. And I think perhaps there's a sort of a tendency, especially from a housing perspective, to think about tenant participation, but not in the ABCD style that Cormac highlighted. So we, we rarely hear about co-production. We really hear about different other forms of collaborative models. I know you at Housing 21 have sort of pioneered a lot of this as well. Um, but for me, I think sort of whether it's... Um, I think, Cormac, you talked about the proliferation, proliferation rather than scalability. And it feels to me, you know, co-housing, collaborative, community land trust, social prescribing, the Froome example you gave is a good example of social prescribing, all lend themselves to thinking about how we can better co-produce uh, both with, within a housing setting, but where that has a place in the community. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. So I think that's a great link across, Jeremy, to the question I was going to you know, ask for Cormac, because I think um, I, I was really struck by your presentation and um, how we've given vested in 
institutions so much power. So a really question of why we've given the institutions the, 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 the lead hand. And I think some of the way we structure um, resident engagement has been um, almost to reinforce the institutionalization of housing rather than to empower the, the people. And the, your, your sequence of um, people doing from themselves um, some, with some help and then the institutions taking the, the what's left and what's needed, we've, we've reversed it. So institutions take what they feel and then leave a little bit of icing on the cake for the other stuff to go on afterwards. So why why has it happened, Cormac? Can you give us any insights to how that's occurred and what we can do to reverse it? Sure. I think, Bruce, you're right, you know, that, that there is a challenge. And, and I take Karen's point, absolutely, that it's not an either or, and it's not about characterizing good or bad. It's, it's about what's the ideal proportionate relationship. And if that gets out of a relationship, actually, it's as dangerous for people who organize institutionally as it is for people who are more disaggregated and, and, and more organizing at commons level as citizens or residents in a local community because you end up with massive amounts of burnout. You're asking people in an institution to take on functions that they just simply can't because the institution isn't designed to create, for example, care in the sense of the vernacular meaning of care, which is the freely given gift of the heart, one person to the other, rather than service, which is often now what people mean when they talk about care, which I find interesting in itself uh, from an anthropological perspective and from an academic perspective, because a lot of academics are doing it too. Um, but I think that, you know, that question, do we think that communities have a function that, uh, you know, what is the function of local residents when they get organized into associations? Are there things they create and produce? And I think most people don't think that thought, Bruce. I think they think that functions and services and, you know, care and health are things that are done by institutions for people. And so there's a kind of a commodification in the narrative, which says my health is in the hands of the doctor, you know, my safety is in the hands of police officers, etc. So many functions, which we think about as functions that kind of are a fall out of the are, are, are an outworking of, you know, connected communities like in Froome, for example, um, are not necessarily going around thinking the thought that we are producers of health that when we organize and we feel a sense of autonomy, a sense of collective agency, that that's very consequential around a whole range of functions, including food sovereignty, care, uh, care for children, uh, you know, safety, health, etc. I think that's part of the difficulty that we're in a culture where a lot of people are thinking very much as passive consumers. They're thinking as clients rather than as citizens. And I think that creates an inversion in democracy where the role of the citizen is defined as that which happens after the important work of the institution is done. And in a democracy, it's meant to be the other way around. The role of the professional is defined as that which happens after the important work of the citizen is done. So I don't think we think that our residents have work to do. I think when we talk about co-production, we're talking about the co-production of services. And what we actually mean is consultate, you know, consulting them in the design of a service as clients. So there's a one up, one down relationship. And so, yes, I do think we have to talk about power. Absolutely. Now, I think it's also important on balance to take Karen's point to say this isn't about the goodies and the baddies. There are plenty of people in the institutional world who want to use their resources and their expertise and their influence to feature and lift up and elevate people's agency, their citizenship, their autonomy and their ability to work together. Um, so, so I think that's the other piece. Are we doing enough? to support housing providers to recognize they're not just providers, they're also precipitators of citizenship and associational life. It's not just provision of service, it's also precipitation of democracy. And actually those two functions are really, really important. Communities are not going to be able to do this on their own. So there's a really important role that institutions can play. And that's why I, I use the hydraulic pump deliberately so that we don't get pulled into the good, bad scenario, but that I can show that there's a virtuous relationship. It can be harmful, but it can also be profoundly helpful if we could just use our influence, our resource, our capacities and our expertise 
something we're not talking about flat earth here we're talking about using our expertise it's really important but not just to fix broken people which is a kind of an old narrative like troubled families hopefully we're way past that and what we're recognizing is is that people should be living their lives in crescendo and, and that's about more freedom that's about more of a sense of agency that's about shared lives and feeling less managed and less done to um and i think more and more uh, professionals i work with are dying to work this way you know and so we need to see better procurement we, we need to see a change in commissioning we need to see a freeing up of acute monies that's getting locked into very traditional services and need move into a new conversation of what are the community alternatives out there that we could support that's, that's brilliant i think uh Cormac, i think you're inspiring a lot of us to, to think differently and i think as a as a chief executive of an institution i need to think about how we um take some of these messages across but lucy you you sent um four um different models that we on a, a, that might apply in that in the co-housing project um the the, the first of those where the residents um the you know citizens of the community um take charge is that asking too much of them or do you think that's a realistic prospect i think it's probably something to be aspired to and i think again it's dependent on the who you've got engaged and their skills and, and what other aspects they've got in their their lives the communities that we've engaged so far within lazelles um are a number of them are part of intergenerational families and one of the reasons is that that they want to move is that they're living in quite overcrowded conditions but they still want to be around to be part of that family group and be close enough to still participate in 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 that aspect of their lives but you know to give and receive support so we've not I don't think we've got anybody who really has got the resource or the time to create a TMO. Um, but that may change as 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 we work with the group and also as new people join join the group. Like Gail again has, has observed the, the group in action quite a lot. So I, I think probably a TMO isn't something that's currently on the cards. Um and maybe the second option of, of working with an agency that works in, in the community. I don't know whether you want to comment, Yale. Well, I agree, I agree, Lucy. And I think it, it's part of the same, you know, who comes with the solution and who thinks, yeah, co-housing, that's what you need to be doing and wanting. But, you know, well, actually, maybe there's a more complex story going on here you know, for the community themselves to decide how to go about it, even though we think co-housing is a wonderful thing. So the question I was probably asking myself on this is, should we be investing in co-housing or should we be investing in um, more um, powers and ways to engender the community so it can decide that co-housing is right? We've, we've jumped too, too many stages down the, down the, the, the route, as it were, to say co-housing is the answer and, and going into that, that approach. So that's perhaps a question to, to ask ourselves a little bit on this. Um, Karen? Well, I just wanted to say something else about institutions to slightly come back to Cormac. You know, as which institutions need to be swept aside and what do we mean by institutions? Because there was something that Lucy said right at the very beginning of her presentation about how your tenure model was primarily rented because that's what your financiers like to see. Uh, that's the thing that they find at uh, least risky. So I'm thinking there is that kind of level above, isn't there? There's that macro level institution, which is the global economy uh, that we need to kind of fix in order to really have autonomy about the decisions that we make about these things. Mm. Can I come in? Yeah, please. Just to, so I, I don't think it's about sweeping institutions aside. Um, and I totally take your point that an awful lot of this is, is quite global in nature. And... Uh, that's accepted one of the realities though i think is is that an awful lot of the solutions are mile wide and inch deep and what people are largely looking for is things that are much more depth in their orientation uh, so they're more like inch wide mile deep and go at the speed of trust and actually a lot of the local institutions that are really well placed 
to do some of that stuff and to act as a buffer sometimes for the harsher winds of bad practice uh, or global, you know, uh, giantism um, are, are key partners, you know, and it, just dealing with somebody at the moment in another country that's dealing with farming communities where Monsanto are creating huge harm to their economic base. But it's people in public health and local institutions there that are acting as the gap between that very big macro, you know, that those meso institutions and sometimes those micro institutions that are really hyper local are an incredibly important uh, buffer against those harsh winds. So I think there are, uh, you know, some of this is about localism. Some of this is also, I think, uh, about subsidiarity, you know, on that principle of no bigger institution will do that, which a smaller institution or potentially even an association might be able to do. So that question of are we modeling where we have influence? Are we modeling ways of enabling, for example, alternatives to food banks, because we know there's a food pantry that could be run by a local community and they're keen to do that. Are we, uh, you know, are we seeing our partners in health continuing to run breastfeeding groups, even though we know that there's mums in our residence associations who'd happily run them themselves? And are we having those conversations? So, yes, there's a lot happening in the harsh world of, you know, what's happening in the Ukraine or whatever. And I'm concerned about that. But are we minding our own knit knitting at the local level? Or are we taking on functions that don't belong to us? I think you do. I think, and I and I believe. I hope um, that um, housing plays a role in that meso level. I think we we've got a great potential to connect um, individual individuals and small neighbourhood communities, and shield buffer support them to be more empowered um, in the wider macro context and the you know the impacts that are playing and I think that's probably the challenge we're trying it in one or two particular ways but I think that's probably a challenge that the sector should embrace um, and I think yeah I know Jeremy and Housing Lynn are advocates of that in, in that that approach um, I don't know if anyone's got to really sort of drawing to I'm consciously drawing to the end of our, our allotted time um, so I'm sort of you know sort of wanting to know if anyone's got something burning they want to to, to share or put it goes I, I was struck by some of the you know there are compromises that you know that we all make in in choices and things we make but which compromise would you like to sweep away I suppose was the question I I sort of wanted to ask each of the the panelists so uh, what, what what change would you like to 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 make Jim, can I come to you first? Because you you haven't spoken recently, and yeah, you know, I think you know very insightful presentation about the the evaluation that you're doing. Anything that strikes you that jumps out that we should be thinking about as as compromises. Repeat the question, Bruce. <laughs> no, I, no, it was wasn't a really well formed question. I'm sorry. It was yeah. So what are the things that sort of you know we you'd like to change or see we could grab hold of um, to do differently, and what we what we could break, what barriers we could break, or what things we're doing which we currently have, you know have to put up with that we shouldn't yeah yeah um i guess it's a so in some ways it's a basic thing but i'm i'm interested in how uh, going back to the question of do can can we get people to want these communities that we're creating i'm i'm quite interested in um the the enabling role of of building well of of building those situations and and groups will come i think uh, if if we if we built all of our housing developments on a on a smaller better scale i think that would that would begin to be a, a step forward uh, yeah do you want to add anything i think that's true i really agree with that and i think what we would probably benefit from is thinking how we can reap these benefits without putting in so much work, for example, through retrofit co-housing and, you know, weaving these connections into existing communities, even part of communities, one street, and, you know, going, you know, going hyper-local in a much simpler way without the housing development aspect of it. Thank you. Lucy? Um, I think for me to speed up some of the institutional processes so we can keep people engaged um, or for us at least to 
be able to explain and sell in the amount of time that it's going to take before anything happens. I think that's where we, we've struggled a little bit in Birmingham, the, the time to get planning, the time to get the land cleared, the time to start building. Um, because people have got a housing need and they've got a housing need now. So how we juggle those those elements of it is a Karen? challenge. Was that me, Bruce? Sorry. Yeah, it was. Yeah, sorry, Karen. Yeah, okay. Well, I suppose the compromise that we're all living under is this hideously marketised housing system that we've all got to kind of limp along with. That would be the thing that I would like to sweep away, but that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and Cormac? Yeah, I, I agree with everybody, really. I think if we can actually design and build things, uh, you know, spaces that are ecologically and, and humanely thought through and, and involve wise, wise decisions, I think that's a great starting point. It creates the climate and the condition within which people can feel well and be well. I think the other thing I would say is to add to this, and it doesn't in any way detract from that, is there's also that piece of recognising where there are limits to that and where it's also useful to not confuse community buildings and what they can do with building community. And I think often the two things are confused with each other. So one of the things I'd love to see is more of an investment in the affective side of community building, which is about the community development, about the community organizing, if there's justice issues, about the community building, and really helping people to connect at that relational level as well, because I think both have to nearly go hand in glove for that kind of cultural uh, sense of this is our place and we're shaping this to happen. Thank you. And so I, I, I think just last few words for me is, is really, I think the, the comments build well, and I think we should build well great places, um, but we should also build well into the communities and the empower the people because, you know, this session is called place and people equals great communities. And, and I think that's really the message that we need to build well on the not only the physical side, but also the community relationship side to get a strong community. So that, thank you to all the, the, you know, the speakers um, for the insights. Thank you for the questions that have been posted. And, and thank you to Housing Lynn for, for hosting a, another really great session. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Well, Bruce, on behalf of the Housing Lynn, can I also thank you for both chairing it and, and sponsoring the session. I think you've picked out the kernel there. It's about building that sort of physical infrastructure, but also nurturing the social architecture as well. And uh, I do implore everybody to read uh, Cormac's uh, book on Connected Communities, uh, a great read and uh, really thought provoking, which uh, it doesn't just apply to co-housing, it applies to all aspects of our lives as, as he's described. Uh, but uh, can I just thank everybody for contributing, thank all the speakers, and I also thank uh, Jerome and Sally behind the scenes, I know you've been uh, treading busily uh, as well. Um, if you found this session of interest, come and join us again tomorrow morning when we kick off uh, at 10 o'clock, when we talk about engaged lives and thinking about how to engage in different ways, and particularly within an extra care housing setting. But uh, for now, can I thank all our contributors this afternoon and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon and have a pleasant evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.